right. So, uh, yeah, I mean, usually I like, you know, I read a book or I find something out and I just want to like, you know, suck all the knowledge out of the person. But then to get Tyson to get your response about you're interested in Sistema and me hearing about this book from Glenn, who had to remind me several times that I needed to read it. <laughs> um, and and the book is all about yarning and putting stories together. Let's just let's just see where it goes. Right. Mm. Um, I, I just want to start by saying, like, I don't I don't understand what the book did to me or how it did it. I only I only know that it was like uh, Flatland, where I, I had what I thought was a very sophisticated understanding of culture and the parameters of civilization and what I was trying to achieve and what was possible. And 20 minutes into listening to the audiobook, which you which you narrate, I was like, oh my God, like you've shown me my culture from a completely different perspective where I can see its its flaws, its limitations, and its potential. And I felt like I was being reminded as opposed to being told. So I just like I don't know what you did or how you did it or whether you wrote a normal book first before <laughs> before turning it into this, but <laughs> but there's there is powerful magic in it for me. There is powerful magic, yeah. That, that's all coming from that old fella. <laughs> yeah, I have to pay my respects to him, um, old man Juma, um, and uh, like a number of others, but primarily, uh, yeah, him. It's his magic in that book that that uh, messes with our DNA, all of us. It, it does. <laughs> it it, cha it changes you. It, it, there's a big ritual magic in those uh, sand talk drawings that he does. Yeah, yeah, there's something about there's something about the imagery um, and the use of imagery in order to not just assist understanding but um kind of reify it in some way it's like it's it, it, you know often sometimes when you have an image or a metaphor it, it almost it can anchor you too soon sometimes to a concept right and you yeah. you get lost in that picture and you're like oh i think i know what that means and then everything that you listen to after that just becomes yeah. some reinforcement of what you think you already know but i didn't That's get it. that i didn't get that with this at all it's like you you, mm. you put up the picture and then i started to listen to it and i'm like i'm not sure i get it i'm not sure where this is going and then it would kind of yeah. percolate and then by the end of it the picture made sense and then the picture also helped me remember yeah. all the complex ideas and things that would come together well, that's, in, in the that's how the the magic works it's not a roofie yeah you know it's not a powerful wizard going zap and turning you into a rabbit yeah you get to you're an agent there you get yeah. to evolve as you wish yeah or, right. or not evolve you can devolve if you like yeah you know what i mean <laughs> um yeah and it's i don't know that there's always that agency like in in proper magic there's always agency Mm. It's it's not something that you can do on your own. Mm. So that idea of somebody doing something on their own to something else. I have the power. <laughs> That's um, you know, in any context, magical or otherwise, it's no good. Right. But um, is the thing, and and when magic is real, one of the indicators for me that it's real. I mean, apart from you know, you know, you check the boss and that. Um, one of the indicators that magic is real. Is that um, is that when it happens, the people who are doing it, they don't really care about it. Mm. You know, like it's it's like it's 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 no big deal. Yeah. And like there is a particular attitude when 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 people practice what a lot of people think of as miraculous stuff. There's a particular attitude where it's it's just no big deal, and they're not really calling on anyone to witness or, and and they're not trying to, and they're not trying to say that it's anything that nobody else can do. You know what I mean? And they're, they're, they're happy to share what it is. And no, 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 it's not a miracle. It's just here. I put this here and I, and I do that, yeah. you know, <laughs> um, that's what attracted me to Sistema when I mm. first saw it is that I was, I was seeing like, you can't tell what's going on on a video, what's real and what's not. But what I did see was an attitude like mm. towards what they were doing. That was just, no, it's right. There's nothing special here. It's just, this is what you do. <laughs> yeah, there's a sense that no, sometimes when, I, when I experienced it, yeah. sorry. There was yep. just no narcissism in it. Sorry, it was a long way of talking to get around to that, but it, I think yeah. it's a really important foundation to ground the conversation. Yeah, no, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, I mean, actually, there's, in my experience of things that I had trouble defining or working with, 
in Sistema. You know, my background, my training was in hard sciences, right? So I did genetics and immunology, and I was, I was very proud of my knowledge and the things that I'd learned um, up to I was about 25. Uh, and I would, you know, dismiss people, religious believers, and other ways of knowing things as just like pff, primitive. We've evolved beyond that. This is, you know, yeah. pat patterns are everything. All there is is logic, reason, and objective you know, induction of things. And I'm not even involved in that process and neither are any other scientists. It doesn't matter who's doing the reasoning or who's doing the deducing. It's all just knowledge, right? Is that, and this is yeah. kind of a little story that scientists as we tell ourselves to, to make the knowledge more powerful or more significant. And, and there's no doubt about it. Science is a very powerful way of figuring things out. And in, in your book, you liken it to pa pattern mind, right? As just like one way of looking at things, like spotting patterns. And science mm. is just one way of spotting patterns and acting on those patterns, like from among many other types of pattern. And and the tendency in science is to boil things down to just the things that you can see immediately and to disconnect them from the wider system um, mm. and all of those things as well, which you allude to in the book a lot as well. But what, what's interesting for me was when I first started to experience things outside of what could easily be explained by a straight scientific reason and what we know about biology and physics and physiology. Um, I think probably my first experience of that was moving to Japan and being at a party like half, you know, coming back from Tokyo after a, a long night. And I was sitting on a, lying on a couch with a, a friend's house that I didn't know all that well. And then this strange middle-aged lady just plonked herself down into the couch next to me. And, uh, and just kind of reached across. She's and she, like, in Japanese. She was like, are you okay? Like, daijoubu? And I was just like, yeah, I'm okay. I'm fine. And she just kind of put her hand over the top of my belly. Like, and it was a good mm -hmm. like, four or five inches away from my belly. And then suddenly it started feeling extraordinarily warm. She didn't touch it. She didn't do anything. It was no trick. And she's just like, you have a lot of problems with your stomach. You should, you should sit, look into that. And then she just sat back into the chair. She didn't try and sell me anything. She, <laughs> she didn't try and like get me to sign up for her cult or anything like that. And I was just like, <laughs> I've been having stomach problems for about six months. And she just somehow sensed it. And then somehow yeah. kind of, she didn't cure me or anything like that. She was just like, and you definitely got something going on. Yeah, she's exactly. Guru. She doesn't yeah. have a studio. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. She's just an old lady. Like yeah. She's someone's granny and she works out the back of the flower shop. Like that's it. Right. You know? Yeah, she's exactly. Special. And that that's when you know it's real. Yeah. And the same thing with Sistema as well. When I, when I first been, I mean, I saw the stuff on the videos too and I'm like, yeah, this is probably fake. Let me try it out yeah. and then I can prove that I, I know stuff and they don't and they're just being silly. You know, they're complicit in some way. Um, and then I met Vladimir and worked with people with enormous skill and enormous ability to kind of steer attention and and yeah. and move you and make you feel things without you understanding it. And, and I've experienced yeah. it and been on the receiving end. And even after having spent time with those people for limited periods of time, been able to do those things. So do you know what I mean? Like yeah. some part of it kind of infects you. And even when you're not trying to, suddenly you, ha you have this for a while and then you're trying to kind of cling to what the what the principles were there how did how did i do that you know and it's kind of fleeting what, but the same thing is true it's like they, it's not a big deal to them they're not like oh watch me do some magic they're like yeah yeah and then they flippantly stop doing it and you move on they're like, yep. yeah, forget about that we'll move on to something else that's not important you know <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's it's very much what the same struck me is that it was kind of on the cusp between a couple of different disciplines hmm. you know in sort of that energetic kind of way it, it it's halfway between like kinetic and 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 illusion sure you yeah. know in terms of like it, it's neither of those things and it's sure. not both either it's it's something else um it is. yeah like I, I i'm often thinking about um you know the way we act on the world with our intent and everything else um and there's basically two two sort of schools of of action in the world right now and and the main one is 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 that that acts on perception hmm. and the other one, which is a bit more old school, is is the one that acts on condition. You know, so that's all our activism and politics and all that sort of stuff. Can, um, can you explain that a bit more? What do you mean by condition? What do you mean? Well, we used to, we we used to, uh, in politics and activism and all that sort of thing. What we used to do decades ago was act to try and change the condition, hmm. and we would act directly on the condition, the social condition that we wanted to change. Hmm. Um, now it, it's about perception. It's about, you know, fighting to be perceived in this way or to okay. be, you know what I mean? Uh, to, be, to, to signal about that you the care branding. about this or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, you can't change the material uh, reality, but you can change its branding. And we can all fight over the branding and then on the optics and what it looks like and what mm -hmm. it's called and all that sort of stuff. Um, and who can marry who in the middle of the whole goddamn thing. That, that's what we're allowed to fight over. 
but in yeah. terms of actual condition, we're, we're not allowed to do that. Um, mm. So I, I'm often thinking about that, you know, um, especially if you read in the book about that idea of the turnaround, that, that sort of interaction between the tangible and intangible worlds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, I don't know, I, I just saw it, I just saw it quite strongly in, in, uh, in, in your discipline, you know, um, the, it's like there were elements of suggestion there. Yeah. But only the kinetic elements that I hadn't been aware of previously, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, it's a completely different thing. Like it needs another, it needs another word. Yeah. It needs another physics to describe what it is that you're doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think people people often come to it and then try and myself included come to it and then try and kind of put it into a, an existing packet or a box or yeah. some cognitive hook they already have. They're like, oh, that's sleight of hand and that's kind of like use of complex physics and that's like a, you know a suggestibility or like manipulating balance or things like that and they try and explain yeah. it all the way with that. But none of the people who explain it that way can actually do it, which is mm -hmm. which is interesting to me. You know, in the same way that you might have you know somebody trying to explain away some um you know old man juma doing something and be like i'm pretty sure he, he had an emp and he disabled the airport that way but you know what i mean they just, they come yeah. up with some sort of thing but they can't do it themselves and they can't do it without an emp and they you know so there's this tendency to want to try and explain something away and something that i've learned is just like why and i think that's one of the things that really arrested me about this book i think i've had this little nagging thing in the back of my head the whole time in which i've trying to been been trying to explore different disciplines of thought and typically the path that most people in modern Western civilizations go is that, okay, we've gone as far as I can with straight up what I'm being force fed um, in the modern world. So I'm going to go old school and go look at like the Stoics and the ancient Greeks and things like that. And then if you're getting really exotic, then maybe you might, you know, read the Vedas and try and study some Indian knowledge or some ancient yeah. Buddhism or even some like ancient Mayan stuff or something like that. Right. And that's, and that's kind of about as far back as, as people go. And, and that's the exoticism and that's the breadth of knowledge. And there's a lot that people gain from that. And a lot of people have um, learned a lot about themselves and the world and how to be decent people by studying older modes of thought than the Greeks, right? Yeah. Um, but reading this book, like as, as Howie kind of alluded to there at the beginning, I, I was reading it, I was like, oh, wow, this goes way further back. Like, this is like all of those things are comparatively new on the on the time scale of, of how to know and understand and think about things. And it just it just seemed to me to open up this entire world of pre-existing thought and, and ways of being that mm. had never even been alluded to, even in kind of somewhat exotic and mm. apparently ancient, a few thousand years old things like like Zen and Buddhism and stuff like that, you know, as you go through it as well. Yeah. It's, so really interesting to me. I was like, wow, what a font is there. And your central thesis in the book, well, not the central, there's <laughs> lots of things in there, but it's, um, but one the of the things you talk you, about anyway. is that, yeah, for me anyway, this idea that in the past when people have looked at indigenous thought, it's been like, well, let's take my modern, Mr. Carruthers anthropologist mask and get my monocle out and we'll look at this quaint little indigenous thought pattern and we'll see if we can mine it for things that are useful and then mm. we'll uh, we'll use that to improve the optics of our sustainability effort or whatever it's going to be right we'll, we'll look at us learning from the Native Americans and look at us mm. do you know what I mean like learning from the people but it's not yeah. really it's not really immersing yourself in that pattern of thought at all it's still using that same Kind of inductive reasoning straight pattern spotting thing and, and yep. what you did was the opposite right? you flipped it you took you took indigenous thought and looked at western thought like it was an alien like it was a bunch of weird populations doing weird things and in doing that we we're like yeah that is weird you know it really was like, you know and that's the first time in my life i've really looked at it that way um yeah. you know, moving to japan and living there made me think about how weird british people are when i started mm. to think about i learned more about britain than i did about japan while i was living there like as yeah um, and the same thing moving to america made me think about that um, Britain and uh, Japan in a different way, but this made me think about mm. being a human being in a different way. Mm. I was like, what assumptions have I been making all this time? You know? Oh well, it's it's not what you've been making. It's it's what what what's been um, kind of programmed. Yeah, I mean, you're living in a context, and you can't be, you know, you can't be responsible for all the ways you, that you, all the evolutionary dynamics of your context yeah. and the pressures that they have on you and the mutations that happen as a result of that. You know, it, it, and it is exciting to talk to different people and just see that entire thing flipped upside down for a minute, as you said, and it's given a bit of a shake. Yeah. And you see what falls out. And, and when you look in there again, you see what's good. You know, it's, it's I, I, I just I hate this critique that's just designed to wreck everything. The idea is that you test things and yeah. you try different lenses to test things. 
And that's mm. what science does. And I like science. And after I tip that bucket up, when I look in, science is still there. Yeah. But the false narratives that sneaky people have attached to science, mm. particularly about our Paleolithic past as human beings. Yeah. There are a lot of false narratives there. And strangely, they all link back to violence mm. and a theory of violence that seems to be trying to justify um, contemporary monopolies on violence and to protect those monopolies on violence is just is just if you're looking for a purpose in the whole thing, uh, I can see that purpose. Not that mm. there's a group of people sitting in a room somewhere deciding to do that. Sure. It's just you get these self-organizing yeah. systems well, and that's self-organizing systems self-organize and and that's yeah and i can go into a few of those the psychologies um like uh not the psychologies but those foundational myths around violence that have come out of you know this sort of oh caveman um kind of assumptions and just challenge a couple of those yeah uh, if you like uh, that'd be great yeah, and, I think and howard, just, wanted, you know, howard want to say something yeah well that's i mean that's what i found personally most powerful i mean i've been sharing i've been taking screenshots and sending them all over to people as if they were like medicine which it is yeah. like but for me when you wrote about like the, the way violence you know you said the world the universe started with a big bang not a big hug and as a vegan i have been trained to dismiss all those narratives of violence but replace them with bunny rabbits and unicorns yeah but also... as a vegan you're somebody who eats babies <laughs> like you eat babies like pretty much your diet is just plant babies is what you're eating all the time <laughs> <laughs> you eat the children of different species like uh, so, yeah. Embrace, embrace your ferocity, brother. You're um, you're yeah, the, the, Eat yeah, those the, babies. Well, I love when you say like like the problem with like violence is inherent, and like we all we can see that. Like you know there aren't you know like vegans don't think that that lions shouldn't hunt. Mm -hmm. um, we're you know the the best of us are trying to be more natural and and be compassionate and minimize you know, the, the evils of, of ownership and uh, objectification of, of mm. animals. But there's still, there, there's still a missing piece about violence that I, that I got from, from your writing that I, is, I think is, is in every indigenous culture. It's in mm. the Native Americans. It's in the indigenous European cultures. But the way you kind of explained it again made made me feel like i could i could encompass that mm. and and go to a higher level of compassion being vegan within this civilization like i feel like within this civilization maybe vegan is the best i can do mm. but you gave me the idea like maybe there's other ways of having civil or or other ways of being human that don't involve civilization so i'd love yeah. for you to talk about violence in terms of expanding the possibilities of what we could become. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah, sorry, I was just thinking about the energetics thing uh, and trying to get a metaphor uh, around that. But look, let, let's just talk in, in complexity theory terms first. You know, basically, as with anything else, violence needs to be distributed, evenly distributed throughout a system you know, and it needs to be constantly moving. Um, and that way it does minimal damage. It's when it becomes concentrated, like artificially concentrated. And I think you guys would know this just from your martial arts practice. You know, you do, you do gather energy to put somewhere yep. for a moment. You gather it temporarily and then you do something with it and it's a gift that you're passing on mm. elsewhere in the system. Now, yeah. what would happen to you if you kept gathering that energy to yourself and you held it and held it and held it? It's not it? healthy. It's not healthy. Like, yeah. yeah. Well, it you destroys you ultimately. Like, yeah. You get sick and then an old lady's got to sit next to you on a bench and say, hey, boy, I can yeah. sort your gut out. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to die. You can't hold that all there. You've got to move that on. It's going to flow through. Yeah. You know. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, violence, like anything else, needs to be distributed evenly throughout mm. a system. And uh, 
you know, currently we're we're living in, in a in a system where uh, that's based on monopolies of violence, where mm. where certain you know privileged groups get to hold a monopoly on violence. Yeah. So, so that's uh, interesting from an American point of view, you know, living here. Yeah. And um, there's a lot of people who are kind of, you know, libertarian and leaning, especially if you go further out to the Midwest yeah, yeah. and stuff. And, and their argument is we all have to have guns. So we have the capacity of violence so that yeah. the government doesn't get the monopoly on it. I mean, that's ignoring the fact that the government now has drones and, <laughs> and stuff like that. Yeah, so exactly. it's not it's not exactly going to wrest the monopoly exactly. back so again by a... having one AR-15, you know, but it's a but that's part of their argument, I guess, to that one. But wh yeah. where do you see that? Well, they, they haven't. The well, they haven't. Well, they haven't. They haven't thought it through. OK, because uh, basically, um, so when everything's distributed throughout a system, so in an economy or a culture, you, we call that a commons, mm. like a commonwealth that we all hold together. Yeah. So if the capacity to, for violence is that, then that's something we all hold together. We're, it's always transparent. So you don't have domestic violence that's going to hurt anybody or bloody kill a kid or anything. It's all transparent. It's all adjudicated. Everybody sees, yeah. you know, it's out in the open. All right. Mm. All you need to destroy a commons is one bad actor. Mm. You know, as you know, the prisoners develop uh, dilemma. Um, you know, it's called a multipolar trap when you have a lot of people with an interest in one thing. All you need is one bad actor to go in and misuse that, or gain an unfair advantage uh, by abusing that system, and then mm. suddenly everybody has to start doing that, mm. and they have to do it forever. Otherwise, he will outcompete them, and mm. wreck the whole thing anyway. You know, so if somebody you know, brings a gun to a knife fight. It's like, shit, now we all got to have guns. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so it, it keeps going like that. And so people think they're being liberated by these things, but they're not. They're just being enslaved by that one bad actor or that minority mm. of bad actors who have attempted to gain a monopoly on the violence. Mm. And it's, I mean, it's that same dude that, you know, so, you know, it's like, oh, he's bought a knife. Great. Now we go, all got to get knives. So everyone gets knives. And then you turn around, he's got a gun. It's like, oh, shit. All right. So we turn around. <laughs> now we all got guns. He's got like, I don't know, Captain America's shield and bloody, <laughs> I don't know what the hell. You know, it's just, it's just this. <laughs> There's no end point to it, right? You, what, it's what you call a self-terminating algorithm. Hmm. So, so, so do you feel um, like that's a that is that an, uh, like an analogy for civilization as a whole that it's kind of developed into this arms race um, that's got a little bit beyond itself in which we're all kind of clawing for something which we didn't actually want in the first place but now it's very yeah. hard to roll back the clock you know so. well basically it's a it's a series of multipolar traps mm. civilization starts off in a series of those multipolar traps like the one i just described mm. um quite accidental usually and then building uh, it ends up becoming a, a system of perverse incentives mm. so the idea of perverse incentive it rewards the worst kind of behavior yeah and um and that becomes that just feeds on itself it becomes like anything com complicated it, it it ends up in complexity it ends mm. up uh, becoming a self-organizing system and those are very hard things to <laughs> they're very hard things to destroy yeah. you know like a human being's a delicate thing as you know mm -hmm. on the one hand but on the other hand incredibly resilient yeah. You know, it, it is actually quite hard to kill one of the damn things. I mean, <laughs> if you haven't got keep, a gun, yeah. <laughs> they keep healing. Yeah. <laughs> they keep healing. <laughs> it's um anyway. Um yeah, it's hard to get back to that original thing. So the the violence, the 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 conflict thing, it does have to be, you know, evenly distributed. Mm. Um, you know, throughout a system in order to do minimal damage. So there's an interesting right. analogy. I mean, I don't know whether this, I don't want to lead you on a, on a tangent, however, there's another mm. direction you want to take it in here, but it's like, there's an interesting um, corollary to that in Sistema, just in practice of it, right? And it's something mm. that people don't do maybe in the beginning, but as you get a bit more advanced, you start to realize that every time you make contact with somebody, like as another human being, when, when people first start to learn about violence and how to defend themselves, right? You have somebody else who feels aggressive and tense. They have a certain energy they're focusing in their fist or their head or mm. wherever they're going to mm. do. Um, and you typically respond to that by either bracing up like in the face of it and being like, yep. I'm just as rigid as that. I can focus just as yeah. much energy. And if I'm bigger, I can flare up like a snake or you know, yep. a cat or something. And if I scare you enough, you'll go away and, or you won't do me off damage. Or they kind of yield to that, right? That force comes mm. in and they just move themselves around, not allowing themselves mm. to be to absorb all of that. But the more you train, the more you realize that um, there's no end to running away. Like if you, if you mm. buckle to that and you allow that concentration, 
then that just it just gets more and more bold and it gets bigger and bigger yeah. and people can chase you down. And if you collide with it, that's fine, provided that you're the stronger of the two in the first place or you have more mm. forces to bring together. But if you weren't lucky enough to be that way, if you're like the, on the lower end of an occupying force coming in, right, or if you're yeah. just the smaller of two guys in the interaction, that is not going to work for you. You can't just collide and make it work. So the solution to that problem, the, the kind of the uh, sophisticated solution that Systema offers is that you literally you find your environment, right? And you try and distribute as much of your force throughout your body, throughout your feet, throughout your environment. And then when people hit you, it gets distributed completely like to your feet, to your arms, That's even it. out into the room. And so when That's people it, punch bro. you, instead of holding you around, you're like, Boop. and then conversely, when you hit people or you try and grapple them, when you touch them or put your hands on them, you're actually trying to distribute all of that force kind of through the whole body uh, mm. so that you can hit them. So you kind of hit them in the soul, you know, you hit them in the idea of them having attacked you and then yeah, it kind yeah. of it crumbles where it was you know it's almost like yeah. you're punching them in the feet in the ground that they're standing on and then they That's just it. rather than kind of just feeling uh you know jolted by that and feeling aggressive and coming back with even more in this kind of zero-sum game that where you just smash each other until one of you's dead you know um, rather mm -hmm. than doing that it kind of ends the conflict because you distribute it in your terms right you're yes. you're taking his energy you're taking yours and you're going all right i'm not going to be all tai chi and move out of the way and run away but <laughs> i'm going to distribute this i'm going to show you what yep. we have together and boom that's, that's what it looks like and then I've, people I've just, just sit down and, and it, it confuses i've the never crowd heard that articulated so well ever that's amazing Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is something that's, that I felt from a physical exactly perspective, it. but I didn't have language yeah. for until you just gave it to me 10 minutes ago. So. Okay. So that's yeah. the, um, yeah, that's exactly it though. That's the, um, that's what, you know, I paused before and I was trying to think about what's a metaphor for the energetics of this. And mm. I just didn't have one, um, you know, not without going into like two days of explaining what, what it would look like for 200 people to sort out a, a horrendous dispute yeah. in, in one small place. Um, yeah. And what that looks like to outsiders viewing it, mm. which is a riot. Uh, so, you know, in my community, that would be reported as a riot, but that's not what's going on. And then mm. you watch more closely and you see something different. Now, there was a, um, there was an anthropologist called Napoleon Shanyan way back in the day. And uh, he filmed Yanomani Indians fighting, mm. you know, and I don't know if you ever came across that. Uh, he called them the most violent people on earth. They actually, they weren't very good at fighting because they didn't do much of it. Um, you know, they just did kind of um, more ritualized kind yeah. of combat kind of things. And when you look at the videos, you can see no one's getting hurt or anything. Hmm. And what they're fighting about is he's come along and given them, you know, machetes and <laughs> things they've never seen before, but not enough of them, like only three or four. And then they're supposed to share that between 300 people and they're having trouble. Hmm. Anyway, look, um, he, he sat down for a few weeks beforehand and he asked them, he got them to report to him all of their genealogies, hmm. who was related to whom and how far back that went. And they all knew it. And so he, he wrote that down and he fed it into his computer. And then he watched the fights and then he saw that there was a pattern coming out of the fights that people were kind of, lo and behold, um, you know, uh, helping out their, their genetic relations. Hmm. You know, they're, the they're genealogical they're groups. Helping they the people they share more out. DNA with more. Yeah. And, yeah. and they were, you know, reluctant to fight anybody that they shared DNA with. And mm. he said, well, these people are too primitive to possibly be able to know their genealogies. So mm. they obviously don't consciously know that, even though they'd reported it to him. <laughs> That's where he got that information from. It wasn't a DNA test. Those didn't exist back then. Yeah. He actually, they reported it to him. And then he said, they couldn't possibly know that what they just told me. And so based on that premise, he then came up with this thing that led to that idea of the selfish gene. Mm. And it also led to the basic principles of game theory. So this idea that, um, that human beings are basically solitary, you know, uh, individual organisms that are basically in the world operating, um, autonomously and selfishly, um, to look out for their own interests mm -hmm. and that that's the primary thing. Any kind of social behavior we do is really only to look after our individual interests anyway, you know, cause mm. we want to replicate ourselves, etc. Mm. And so, you know, so you got that, that gave rise to the current economic system that we're living in. Mm. So one that was, was that started getting kind of introduced back in the seventies, 
uh, the year I was born, right, right back towards the start there. And then, you know, basically grew through the Reagan and Thatcher era, you know, mm. that this, this rampant individualism kind of thing. So, yeah. you know, you, you can see these, these ideas of projecting things back onto the primitive, especially around violence, is pretty mm. much what's built the society. So mm. you'll read, um, you, you read, you read any text and, and, and it'll, it'll, it'll be a scientific text and it'll have all this awesome evidence-based stuff like that is just ironclad and mm. like a really good progression of logic. And then all of a sudden you'll see this, this line of code come in from a story that isn't mm. from wrong story. And yeah. they'll say something like, um, prior to the invention of agriculture, 30% of human beings died from homicide. And you're like, yeah. Where'd you get that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can you tell me where that what the data set you used? Yeah. Uh -huh. Look at that, you bastard. Like, <laughs> no, your science is good. Don't mess up your science with that bullshit. Like, <laughs> seriously. Anyway, um, well, so it, it's going. So you basically, so all your psychologies, economics, governance, law, everything, all these disciplines are grounded in, in a few wrong stories about paleolithic life and and the caveman bloody thing and and it's all based on the okay so fight or flight mm -hmm. so as practitioners both of you know that's bullshit yeah that's it both, a, of, both there's of a spectrum know, of stuff mm -hmm. in your body and in the energies that you're working with and you know in your mind that you know is more distributed than just brain bound you know that's bullshit mm -hmm. that fight or flight is not what we're based on that's mm -hmm. not the basis of human behavior and and so you wonder, well, how is that so? Because you still have the story. You've got this line of code in you that's telling you, well, you know, so a caveman walking around alone in the wilderness would be constantly in a state of hypervigilance mm -hmm. because you never know when a tiger's going to jump out at you. Mm -hmm. But if you spend time with any indigenous people, you'll learn really fast that we always know where the predators are. Mm hmm like always, like we know where the predators are, mm -hmm. you know, the flat, what's flowering, like what plants are flowering will tell us and where the shadows are falling in combination with that will tell us where the predators are at mm -hmm. any moment in any place. Mm -hmm. You know, there are a thousand things you're doing reading your context in that distributed mind. Mm -hmm. Plus we have a relationship with those predators. Mm -hmm. And so in any community that lives side by side with predators, you'll find that nobody has ever been eaten by one in that community. It just doesn't happen. Hmm. It doesn't happen. And so what does that do to your visitors, visitors get eaten sometimes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Visitors yeah. do get eaten. And then we've got this man eater thing. And there's like, yeah. you know, there's megafauna coughing up pith helmets left, right and center. You know, it, it happens. And, and we're just like, oh, sorry about that. I just, we didn't know that tiger was there. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> anyway, look, uh, you know, as human beings, we've all had relationships with these things. You know, you've got like uh, where this, like the, the place where, you're, where, you're, where your discipline is coming from. It's like, you know, you're talking about the, the people who are developing that are, are only, are almost within living memory of, of following bears <clears throat> mm. to find the, the, the edible fungi, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, they, they have a relation with those predators mm. and they have a relation with, with the wolves mm. and, you know, um, you know, even Cossacks who were kind of in this transitional, you know, culture coming out of something, coming out of something land-based and real and into something industrial, mm. th these Cossacks that, they, they never got eaten by a wolf. Mm. They knew what they were doing out there. Mm. You know, you could drop a Cossack naked in, in the middle of winter in a blizzard. And, you know, three days later, he'd come out fully clothed <laughs> right. with yeah. animal skins and like, you know, and with yeah. well, it's, and it's... heads of, of the enemy kind of thing, you know, <laughs> it's, um, and, and, and this is, this is purely an understanding of landscape and, and a mastery of, of, of knowledge. And, and relation um, with all of these entities in that landscape, including the predators. Yeah. You know? So I can I can see how you know my Western mind would 
impose fight or flight on that because we have we have a concept in our culture called loneliness which yeah. d doesn't it doesn't map onto an indigenous person. You know, you mentioned when you're talking about the Paleolithic myth that the data right. set was people who weren't worthy of the sky burial. So they're the yep. ones whose bones we have, and they're, you know, rogues, brigands, misfits. But, you know, like in the research I've done, and I try to tell people how to eat healthy, how to exercise, but if I could give them one thing that would prolong their life and the quality of their life, it would be relationship. Mm -hmm. And so when you, when you are like fight or flight occurs when you're alone, right? If you're if you're wandering away from your group, then you do have to be hyper vigilant because you don't yeah. have ancestor mind or, you know, communal mind to protect you. Yeah. So here you are. You're a modern domesticated human in your individualized feedlot, you know, in your partition feedlot. And you're trying to imagine being dropped into the middle of the wilderness, whatever the hell that's supposed to mean. Of course, you're going to see it that way. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and, and you don't really understand. All you have is weak connections. But then, you know, uh, uh, sort of that you're, that you're thinking about at the front of your mind. But if you start to think more deeply about your strong connections and and that web that it forms and the pattern that that forms you're like aha yeah, that's where my mind is like i don't know anything outside of my relations mm. and i don't mean like you know grandma and, and like yes that's part of your relations but you know your relations with uh non-human entities and you know and not just carbon-based life forms but all these things around you like rocks and you know everything you, you have this relation uh, particularly to place and to land and basically you cannot have a memory without a spatial map mm. you know and your neural science and and cognitive sciences will back this up yeah. for you that that it's all navigational your yeah. memories i think are um are spaces that you navigate yeah. in your mind you're constantly forming a map and in that map are stories and so there is a narrator who's narrating your life that's part of your part of your mind. I can see how he's grinning there because his last podcast guest was Barbara Tversky, the famous yeah, um, wife of Amos Tversky who did all the research in spatial thinking. And we, we just oh, had her on our podcast and she I just talked we... about all the same thing, just completely from a purely scientific point of view and how much trouble she had getting that concept through to people uh, who are convinced that all language has to be verbal first and you think in words and stuff like that, you know? So, so it was, yeah. uh, it's fascinating to see that coalesce from a different place, you know? So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, let's, well let's, I... skip, let's skip all that then and just say, like, refer to that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm just saying it's, uh, it's you know, just, it's no, beautiful. No, seriously, it's, it's again, uh, pre-existing yeah. rediscovered knowledge, you know? It's, like, it's just going great. Yeah. We, we already, we already have this, so we, we don't have to set that foundational thing. We're sharing that, uh, understanding so we can build on that yeah but i i had two undomesticated hours in my life and I, and they were assisted by fungi uh, -huh. uh and you know yeah the rocks are you know the, the trees the field the breeze like it all it all made sense in a way and then it went away and yeah. you know short, well, short you know of, what yeah i always tell people to pay attention to one thing only in that and it's not this uh uh, the cosmos that, that they think they're experiencing. What I ask them to pay attention to is the tether. Uh, what is the tether that uh, is going to allow you to, to find your way back? Hmm. Um, pay attention to next time you go on, you go in, pay attention to the tether and study that tether and see where it goes. Cause that's where you belong. You know what I mean? And it's kind of like almost the rest of the trip is a distraction. <laughs> but where the most valuable information is, is to find out where you're grounded and what you're, what you're connected to here, in this place here. Hmm. You know? Um, yeah. And, and that, that's the most valuable thing you can, you can learn um, um, from having this tangible reality pass away for a while is to find out where you're grounded in this reality. So you follow that tether. Do you know what I mean by a tether? Did you have a sense of being still? Um, well, it must have been there because you're you're not a yeah, vegetable. Yeah, there's a, right there's, now, a so. there's a there's a there's a me that was there. Yeah, there was there was definitely a line 
like I remember a, a couple of conversations where I was just sort of giggling at what I knew mm. in conversation with people who didn't know it at that moment. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, my, my wife asked me at one point, you know, there's a plant in the garden that's not thriving. Could I maybe find out what was going on? And I was just, I just remember laughing, going, oh, that's, sweetie, that's not how it works. <laughs> like, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, like you know, the, the dissolution of my own uh, ego spotlight. Like, everything, mm. everything was what it was. I mm. was just not evaluating it in terms of what can you do for me, baby? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so, Can I ask you a question? No, uh, oh, sorry. It, it, sorry, that just... Look, I, I think uh, the most important thing about conflict and, and about um, violence is that it's, it's kind of necessary. It's kind of the manure that makes, makes things work. Hmm. You know, that's why... And you, you can't have that manure piled up in the middle of the field. It's got to be spread evenly throughout. Hmm. You know what I mean? Um, and, and you need it. You need a bit of push-pull. You don't know where your edges are unless you get those edges smacked from time to time, you know? And, um, and basically, it's very difficult um, uh, to be in co-evolutionary relation with the landscape unless there is that, um, that, that sort of current of violence running through. And all we know about violence is that it's ugly and terrible. It's because we've only seen that expression of uneven violence, you know, but when it's even, when it's a dance, it, it's a beautiful thing. So, um, yeah, and it was the plant that you mentioned just now, um, like recently. So we, we've had this little mint, um, a mint plant uh, out in the garden. It's been there six months and it hasn't grown. It's sat there and then recently it started just withering even smaller and smaller back into itself. And it looked like it was going to die. So I didn't put fertilizer or anything like that. What I did was I went out and bought five other different kinds of mint and planted them all around it really close to it. Mm. And within, within three days, <laughs> that little dying mint plant had quadrupled in size. Going, no, you fucking don't spearmint. I'm, <laughs> you know, <laughs> hey, peppermint, back off. I'm fucking, this is my, this is my grave. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you know what I mean? And that is what made it healthy. And mm. they're in this kind of relation and dance together now, though, those mints, which mm. is, uh, they're not other. It's funny. They're actually, they're all growing each other up. And it's not in this weird arms race either. They, they've ended up in this complementary relation, which mm. is, which is pretty awesome. Now, indigenous martial arts, um, in, in the way that I've learned them and, and participated in them, you know, they, they are quite ritualized. You know, we have mm. really strong protocols. Um, and so a couple of them I mentioned in the book, and one of them is, is based on how kangaroos fight. Mm. You know, and kangaroos, male kangaroos always, they do those dominance, those rituals, those fighting rituals, but they never, they never hurt each other. It is horrifically violent. And you think, oh, my God, like one of those kangaroos is going to die. That They never die mm. or get particularly injured. But it's very violent. And it's mm. also very beautiful. And so um, there was one uh, uh, called Corrida, uh, uh, a form that I learned for a while. I just wasn't very good at it. But the first part of it is is a kangaroo dance. And mm. then you come in and, 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 and it's this very violent sort of wrestling that's kind of beautiful. You're making something together in the space. You're making a mm. pattern and yeah. you're coming out together. The, the idea is that, you know, together you come out with whatever it is resolved. Yeah. And neither of you is particularly damaged. And mm. even, and the other thing I mentioned was a, a form of knife fighting uh, from Southeast Queensland. I was going to um, ask you about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That I learned. And that is really good. Um, because I don't know if you can imagine fight knife fighting somebody and you've got two elders standing either side of you with spears and if you break the rule you're going to get speared so you gotta you have to no matter how angry you are you've got to follow the rules and the rules are you're not allowed to cut anybody anywhere on the front of their body mm -hmm. you know you're only allowed to cut them on the back mm -hmm. and shoulders mm -hmm. that's it not on the face mm -hmm. <laughs> only on the back mm -hmm. can you imagine how hard it would be to cut somebody on the back when they're holding a knife too right yeah. Pretty much in order to be able to reach their back, you'd have to expose your own. Sure. And so the moves that come out of that are so 
like 5D chess bloody moves that come mm. out of it mm. that you're forced and, and, and so your extreme creativity kicks in and it's very hard to maintain um, wrong anger yeah, or wrong story. You know, if you're coming into that protecting a lie or doubling down on a lie yeah. and getting angry at that, that other person, that lie will not stand. Mm. Not, not in yourself. Mm. It will have to be purged. Yeah. And so, and the thing is that, so even if, if you manage to cut somebody, so the winner is the one who, who, who leaves the most cuts on the other person. But at the end of the fight, those old fellas standing off to the side with the spears, they will cut up, they'll stand them two combatants side by side and they'll do cuts to make sure that each combatant is walking away with exactly the same cuts. That, so this was something I was going to ask you about. So um, hmm. like Howie, I've been recommending this book to everybody that I know since reading it. And there's a friend of mine, Brian Marco, who also trains, he's a instructor in training in Sustammer as well. And he read this book yeah. and it blew his mind. Really, he's still just processing it. Um, and he said that he thought that really resonated with, with him because he just thought about the idea of violence as having always just like a dominant winner and then a submissive loser and like somebody wins a fight somebody loses a fight and it's just always kind of this one-way interaction as you start to do it but um and then that kind of colors our whole interactions with people when we have a, like a verbal argument it's just like well i have to win we're not negotiating anything here i have to make mm -hmm. sure you're humiliated and that i'm right and that everybody who's watching knows that i'm right and there's no mm -hmm. distinction but it's like well what if every time you cut somebody with a knife you knew that you were going to get that back at the end of the fight, right? You knew at the end of the fight, every time you're cutting somebody, you're cutting yourself, right? The same depth, the same place and that kind of stuff. If you knew that was the case, if you knew we're going to, you were going to get it back, then it would you're make you fight yourself. in a different way. You would make you fight. You, you would still fight. You'd still find a yeah. way to ritualize it and find a way to sort yeah. out the agreement through that. But knowing that you're cutting yourself would make you less cruel and like you say, it's impossible then to carry that anger because it would make mm. you dumb and stupid in the fight as well. You'd yep. get cut more anyway. And also it wouldn't really serve you because you're just hurting yourself. And he took mm. that as a metaphor for what we do to ourselves in society. Do you know what I mean? Like we do this and yeah. if more people understood and kind of health, in a healthy way fought that way. And in Sistema, yeah. we have parallels to this. And the second thing I was going to say is that we have a, a form of uh, fighting called soft work where, you know, we'll roll and wrestle and ground fight on the ground and it, in, and we'll punch even and kick and do stuff like that. And, and in theory, anything goes, you can strangle somebody, you can choke them, you can, you know, get them into a lock where you could almost bust their elbow and you can thump them. But in practice, what we do is that both people um, move a little bit slower than you ordinarily would just so that you can keep the control. You move at like 60% of your full speed or something. Um, mm. And then you, if you feel any kind of resistance, so as you start to kind of try and pull somebody into a headlock, the second you feel, any kind of like, oh, it's going to be a struggle to pull his head down here. You move and you shift to another position. And then in doing right. so, both people kind of move around each other continuously. And you have yeah. to play this complex five-dimensional chess because you can't rely yeah. on the aggression and the force. Um, and it turns into something spectacularly useful yeah. like because you're learning to be more creative as you play. And it's putting these um, constraints on the combat that makes it creative and interesting. And then it also yeah. allows both people to feel satisfied at the end of it rather than one person just feeling like they got owned and this, and just feeling kind of hard about it or feeling sorry for themselves. Yeah. Like both people come out of that kind of combat with joy, you know, in their heart yeah. and like they, that they've built each other up. It's like a hearty hug, like a man hug or a slap on the back, but 20 yeah. times better, you know, you had a fight and it was great. And you see this, yeah. you know, sometimes you'll see this even in sports, you know, good boxers or really professional MMA fighters or something, they'll slug it out and they'll really go for it. And at the end of the fight, they are genuinely, they have deep respect for each other and that's there, but it's not quite the same thing, right? It's not quite mm. the, to the same extent. And um, usually because there's other things riding on it, like ego yep. and titles and status and not a little amount of money a lot of the time. Yeah, as well. yeah. <laughs> so there's other things thrown in, but it, it seems to me there's, a, there's an enormous place for this kind of ritualized combat and this ritualized violence um mm -hmm. for people who normally would abhor it would be like no i don't want to do it i hate yeah. hitting people i don't like doing this and it's because they're afraid of what it is and the problem is that if you if you're afraid of what it is it's not you you're allowing somebody mm. else to distribute the violence like mm. you said right you're allowing yeah. some people to have a monopoly on it while you try yeah. and absolve yourself of the of the need for it but it doesn't work that yeah. way right? so, yeah. oh it just goes so far beyond empathy and it, it's yeah. like a it's this connectedness this really solid connectedness. And I think that's what grabbed me when mm. I saw those YouTube videos 10 years ago, you know, mm. and it wasn't, and I looked at a lot of them, the Sistema ones. Mm. And I, I was less impressed by the, you know, you know, massive guy all in red in a big stadium doing a demonstration, 
Mm. And now I will knock down 50 people with Jedi power from my balls. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> you know and everybody, ah, falls over. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, and, and I'm sure that was real, but I was less impressed with that than I was. I, I kept watching this one dude and he was just this little, short, old, fat dude. <laughs> and just... <laughs> Yeah, a big smile all the time, and he's just looking around all the time, and he's just in relation around him, and he's got all these massive, young, fit, strong fellas all standing around him, and he just he's just loving them, you know. And he's, that's, and he's yeah. And so he he's knows, he's our instructor. He's, he's the head of our system. That's Mikhail oh, Diabko. So God, <laughs> he's guy. he's the top it was guy. That yeah. guy that I saw, and yeah. I kept watching him, and he's just smiling, and he's just it's it's almost this this just this it's not just love like that hippy dippy love. It's just his. It's what you described before that uh, putting it, it, putting yourself out into a, a distributor through the entire system around you, mm. and he's just like he's not hurting anybody. But anybody, it doesn't matter. They keep, machine gun, whatever. They're coming at him with everything, and he's just barely moving. Mm. <laughs> it's this tiny little thing with a smile on his face, and just yeah. <laughs> cleaning the place up, you know, and. Um, <laughs> But in, in such a positive way, and, and you can see, and it's the look on the, it was the look on the eyes of, of the big men when they fell. Mm. It was initial shock, but then this kind of, there was this weird kind of gratitude in their eyes. Like, I, I just learned something. I've just come into something. Yeah. I'm part, I'm, I, you've made me part of something bigger than me right now. Mm. Um, and he's just bringing them in. And, and that was what grabbed me. I went, ah. Oh. Mm. I can't wait till I get to talk to one of these people. It's amazing that um, I'm talking to people now who, uh, you know, that's your, yeah, that's your teacher. Well, <laughs> that's yeah, it's, it's what it was fascinating to me is that it's. I mean, I've been training this for 15 years, and it's taken me so many years to try to get past the beginnings of the ego and the ideas and the indoctrination and the other things yeah. to fully appreciate what Systema is and to fully appreciate what it does. What's fascinating mm. to me is, is that 99% of people look at that video of the little fat monk looking guy throwing people around and smiling and they're like, yeah, that's fake. Or he's not even trying or that's not a real fight. Or do you know what I mean? Like he's, no, he, he should be more tense. Was. He should be more angry. That can't be like a real <laughs> a useful fight. And that, so most job. people would look at that and be like, that's worthless or that's fake or that's something else. But you, without the direct experience of training Sistema, look at it and then yeah. see it for exactly what it is that it's taken me yep. 15 years to learn. So it's, what's mm. fascinating to me is that again, there's like an undercurrent of rediscovered knowledge here. Do you know what I mean? You've, mm -hmm. you, you have this knowledge from a completely different place that predates like, the, the knowledge base that I got it from. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like it, there's but something it's, shared. It's there's something the we've same lost. Place. Yeah. We, have, we have over a million years together Yeah, yeah. of, of, of shared history. Right. You know, we, we, all of us look up at the night sky and there yeah. are several constellations that are named the same way all around the planet. Sure. Yeah, and it's yeah. not because those stars form a particular shape in the sky, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, like Orion. Yeah. Orion does not look like a man. No, it looks like a and, fucking and, rhombus and, and, with, a, with the three dots in it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but everyone calls him a hunter or a warrior all around yeah. the world. You know yeah. what I mean? There's a reason for that. We share a common origin. We share a common story. Um, we share a common purpose. You know, mm. we are the custodial species of the planet mm. and we have, um, you know, very particular, very special ways of, of, of working with our energies to make that happen. And it is that distributive energy mm. system that you described better than I've ever heard it described before, better than I've ever described myself. You just nailed it. Um, and, and that's it. It's what mm. we're supposed to do. We're mm. supposed to be working that stuff. Yeah. And I'm so glad that I, that I, as soon as I saw that, I marked it in my head. One day I'm going to talk to these fellas and I'm talking to you now. It's so beautiful. But um, yeah, it's the same thing. And we're all coming from the same place. Mm. And, and we all have these shattered fragments of the pattern. You know, within our relations with each other, we still have these shattered fragments of mm. this pattern, you know, as these domesticated beings that we've become only in the last hundred years or so. It hasn't mm. been that long. Hmm. You know, nations were only invented a century ago hmm. you know the industrial era has been very brief hmm. and it's 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 domesticated us quite a bit hmm. most of the people on the planet a hundred years ago were still living in relation to the land hmm. and we're still living some 
aspect of that pattern. Mm -hmm. So it's not that long ago mm -hmm. and we all share it. We all carry it together and we know what it is when we meet mm -hmm. and it's a beautiful thing. It doesn't take much to recover it. Yeah. So the, the part that has been affecting people the most, the part of the book, is your talk about domestication and specifically edu how education, because I know so many people like my son, we had him homeschooled because school wasn't working. And he and with all of our efforts, he still has this sense of, well, I wasn't smart enough for school. Mm -hmm. uh, my business partner also, you know, he he grew up in South Louisiana, learning hunting and fishing and sailing and trapping and fixing engines and things like mm -hmm. that, and loved it and felt he was stupid because he was bored in school. And mm -hmm. you, you, you talk about like the three steps for domesticating an, a wild animal. And when I read them, I'm like, oh, that sounds like schooling. Right. Separate the young from their parents during daylight hours, confine them into space with with limited stimulation and use rewards and punishment to force them to do meaningless tasks. Yep. And how do we I mean, I can feel it in myself, you know, all the all the ways in which I seek approval within the, the conditioning of that system. Mm. How how do we begin to undomesticate? ourselves when it feels like we're, you know, it's like a treadmill, like the faster I go, the more domesticated thinking I apply to the problem. Yeah. Um, well, it's, it's, I, I, I guess it's just through that distributed mind uh, hmm. that your teacher just told, told you about, you know, it's, it's having that uh, a lot of people are, um, are doing self work. <laughs> They're trying to self actualize. Uh, how can I undomesticate myself? Um, you can't, you can only do that in a context. Uh, it, you're part of a self-organizing system that's observing itself, healing itself, working towards something. And you're just a node in that, you know? So if, if you're able to spread, spread your mind out to become part of the field and then realize that it's not even yours, <laughs> that you're in that and you're a node moving around in that complex system. Um, that's, that's all you can do. So, so there's like full responsibility and zero responsibility at the same time. Exactly. And look, and, and, and gradually you'll come to see that all these forced choices, those binaries like that one, you just said that they don't exist. Anytime when somebody's giving you a, um, a binary fight or flight, you know, left or right, um, nature or nurture, usually it's both of those things <laughs> and neither of those things at once. And then you start to see, well, that see that little two dimensional plane there. Oh, actually there are a million things all coming through that. Mm. And that's coming in this bigger thing that has heat. Everything's everything starts to look like a small part of a brain, you know, it's like every, yeah. every cell is connected to a thousand other kind of cells and, and you're yeah. just not seeing the other dendrites and neurons, you know, in the system. Yeah, that's know, it. Like, yeah, that's it. And we've been forced to look at things. It's well, it's either a zero or it's a one, mm. you know, and, and that's it. It's either, you know, do you agree to these terms and conditions or do you not? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's these are uh, forced choices, you know, yeah. um, uh, will you voluntarily get into this cattle truck or will you get shot? Hmm. You know, and those in Poland famously who said, no, nah, we're not getting in that fucking truck. Hmm. Um, they were the ones who had the higher <laughs> rate of survival than the ones who agreed to get on the truck. Hmm. You know, um, it's, you know, it, it, when, when you refuse the, for, the forced choices and you recover that small amount of agency uh, just for a moment, then you start to see a universe of possibilities coming out. And if you do that collectively with others and, and profoundly in place, and you're doing that distributed energetic work that you've described so perfectly, um, it, you start becoming situated you know, mm -hmm. in this complex self-organizing system again. And it, it goes, Oh, welcome home. And, um, and then off we go. Can I, yeah. can I ask a question about um, 
how that might relate to what you describe in the book as ancestor mind, um, because you kind of you start to talk about what ancestor mind is as kind of like a state mm. in which you kind of attuned to everything, plugged in. Mm. And as soon as you started talking about that in the book, I'm like, ah, oh, this is what we call the state in Sistema. This is this is the yeah. state where you feel like you're not making decisions, that you're just completely in yeah. the present moment. You're kind of drawing from something else. You're not having yeah. to cognitively process anything. Um, and in, in Sistema, as a, as a way of cultivating that, we try, we try to or one of the reasons I think Sistema exists is, is almost as like as a response to kind of like 19th century mm. industrialization. I had a guy on a mm. couple of um, a couple of weeks ago who was talking about the history of where it came from and the Cossacks and mm. stuff like that. And the, a lot of the messages that are there in Sistema now, like, you know, modern you life stresses. What's that? Did you say Cossacks? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Ah, see, I didn't know that connection. I was mentioning Cossacks before. Yeah, yeah. See, oh, I thought I thought you All knew, right. and that's why you brought it up. No, yeah, I, it's, yeah, I has didn't know. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. All right. Yeah. So that's the genealogy of that. All yeah. Right. It's, yeah. It's part of okay. it comes so through I've those seen, Slavic. Cultures. I've seen two different two different parts of the story. Yeah. And then intuited the the middle yeah. part. Okay. Yeah, you did. Yeah, I yeah, just thought yeah. you knew. I thought you. Were, well, that's brilliant. <laughs> no. Yeah. All right. Sweet. But um, but yeah, but he was talking about how like a lot of what we talk about now about um in Sistema as, as, a, as using Sistema as like an antidote to modern life and stress and just thinking too much about things and just like getting the wrong angle, like, you know, the wrong story, basically. You're building yourself yeah. a wrong story like, and it's slipping in all over the place, right, this way, right? Yeah. Um, it's, and it's talked about by the founders, including Mikhail Budabko, the guy that you mentioned. Um, and and this, the antidote to that within Sistema is just, is, is not thinking more about how you're thinking the wrong thing or trying to think and contextualize and trying to think a different way. It's by radically kind of radically improving your awareness. It's, it's mm. by doing practices that connect you more with your own body with and your body mm. with the environment around you until you feel like that it's merged and there's a blurred line yeah. between the edge of your skin and everything that's around you. Right. I'm, yeah. and I'm, I'm paraphrasing part of, here. part of a system, part of a system that's observing itself. Yeah, I, I, you're exactly. No stand, trying to stand outside a system that you're in, trying exactly. to observe it yourself in it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And when, when you're it. in that state, everything comes together, you fight really well, you can yep. see attacks before they start to build, you can intuit things about people. And it's and sometimes it's fleeting when you're practicing and you lose it, and then it comes back yep. again. But we're trying to cultivate that as a way of, of, of getting rid of that. Is, is that. Is that akin to what you describe in Ancestor Mind? It's exactly, like you try to cultivate Ancestor Mind as a way of not getting that's exactly stuck in these like, hyper-focused patterns? But it's, it's always coming from um, some kind of haptic practice. Mm. you know where you're doing something uh, with your body yeah where where something else a tool or another person or emotion or something becomes an extension mm. of your mind because that's the first step and then you get into it now mm. I, I would argue really strongly that howie has experienced um this state more than twice with some mushrooms mm. you know what i mean I, I would i would say that he's experienced ancestor mind regularly through his training Hmm. Um, uh, with hmm. you, would hmm. I be? Would that be getting close to accurate, Howie? Um, that you've had glimpses hmm. of um, of a kind of a, I've you had, know, a, a yeah, I've way had, of being in time and place. Yeah, I think the tr the trouble is, and like when I asked you the question about how could I self actualize, like even reading the book, even being like I, I didn't hear the assumption of atomization and singularity. So I think what happens is when I reflect back on those moments, I'm like, oh, like that's going to go in the, the the greatest hits reel. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like it, it quickly collapses into ego. Yeah. Um, you know, yes, there, yeah, there have been moments where I just acted in a way that was transcendent. Like I did the right thing. I said the right thing. I moved in the right way. And it's so quickly that it sort of rebounds into self-congratulation that I think mm. I miss I miss them a lot. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, I I do that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, in, in the last few years, I've actually I've experienced quite a profound state of disconnection um, uh, since moving to a city. Yeah, and I find it very hard um, to get into any kind of um, real state of being in, in my place, um, and and I it's it's that thing that keeps coming back that keeps pulling me back, 
And I, I guess people, when I talk to people who meditate and all that sort of thing, they, they talk about the same thing. Yeah. Is that that moment of, I'm doing it, I'm doing it. Ah, oh, fuck, I lost it. Yeah. <laughs> you see that when you're teaching a kid to ride a bike. Like, yeah. yeah. Look, watch me, Daddy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Look, no hands. Ah. Yeah. yeah and, I, and I get that when I'm performing and uh, musically and improvising. That the, yeah. the minute I start to feel proud of what I'm doing. Special. Like, yeah, like, okay, well, let's, you know, your turn now. Yeah. Well, I, see, that's what rites of passage do. And, and I'm sure you have several of them in your, um, in your discipline. You know, these rites of passage, these ritualized moments where you come through something very, very difficult that just gives you that slap that lets you know, hey, mm -hmm. you're not special. <laughs> yeah, one of them is literally getting slapped for, for 20 minutes. It's, it's, we do Fantastic. one where you, where you breathe in, you breathe out, you hold your breath on the exhale, and then somebody kneels on your chest and punches you in the face and chest until, while you hold your breath on the exhale. And then while you're coming around, they hit you harder, and then they gradually go softer and softer and softer and softer, and it almost turns into a massage. And then when you go through it, you feel like you've lost um, about 50 pounds worth of tension and psychological angst and anxiety. And, and you kind of like, wow. it's, it's like you pupate and you come out of something a little bit different, you know? It's like, so that's one of the ones that we've got. It's like, a, and we do another one with water as well, like um, uh, kind of drowning like type stuff as well. There's, 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 there's a few kind of ritualized yeah. experiences like that. And there's yeah. massages used that way too. And the extraordinarily deep massage that goes right to the bone that you, that's difficult to tolerate that you have yeah. to breathe your way around and distribute the force from in order to, to feel good with. And at the end of it, you feel completely cleansed. You know, there's, there's a whole bunch of different yeah. things. Yeah. Cool. So, so something I was going to ask about. So do you have any uh, kind of thoughts or observations on just kind of what's happening right now? Because obviously the whole world is, it's been getting towards a tendency towards more progress, life getting faster and faster. The, the inputs we're getting from freaking social media and you know notifications and updates and email it's just making us more and more ADD more and more kind of um, jumping around between distracted points it's like is we, we can try and get hyper focused for a while and then we jump and flip and our attention is being pulled in lots and lots of different directions and rarely is it being pulled this way right towards other people like and the environment that we're in and trees and mm. rocks and everything that's in it it's usually being pulled like here like back into behind your eyeballs and spending mm. all of your time just focusing in a very cognitive way um, and obviously mm. over the last six months most places of that's just been accentuated with people being forced to just being on zoom like six hours a day through their work and not yeah. being able to connect with each other. And some people even for long periods, not even been able to go outside for a walk, you mm. know, in some places, mm. but what, what effects have you seen? And from your perspective and your knowledge, what's, what are you seeing happening? And maybe even do you, what, what do you see the pandemic being a, a result of? Is it like an, yeah. is, is it an inevitable result of kind of selfish civilization mm. and the way that we stay too long in a place? Or is there something yeah. else happening from your point of Look, view? It's, I'm, I'm sick of people being blamed, humans being blamed for this, hmm. you know, as a species. And this idea that we're all selfish, you know, hmm. we didn't place ourselves in these little individualized feedlots. Hmm. You know, we didn't build those. Hmm. We, you didn't build your own cage. Mm -hmm. You know, you're in it, but you didn't build it. So I, I don't like that idea of humans being selfish. And I told you the, the study where that idea came out of sure. earlier, because we're not like that. I mean, mm -hmm. as you know, from your mm -hmm. practice, sure. you know, that's not what we're like at mm -hmm. our foundation. That's not what we're designed for. We're designed for something else. Yeah. And basically it does come down the entire meta crisis we're facing now. And it is a meta crisis. It does come down to um, m the monop monopolization of violence, hmm. um, the monopolies of violence that have been created uh, throughout the world. And it's ever since um, um, war became an industry, hmm. you know, in these civilizations, which is an inevitable result of, of civilization. You know, that is, like I say, it's a self-terminating algorithm. Hmm. And every now and then it crashes the system and the system has to be rebooted hmm. and it's rebooted been rebooted now so many times but you as you know when you when you reboot your computer and return it to its factory settings you know it's not like you've got a new computer that computer's hmm. a little bit stuffed and hmm. you haven't got long once you have to put it back to factory settings you don't have two years left of life on that computer you're hmm. gonna have to get a new one probably within 12 months hmm. you know 
and and sort of that's where we're going we've rebooted this thing so many times hmm. when i say we it's like not we hmm. you know it's like 80 families hmm. um you know so, and then so you... the system the system itself as i said is self-organizing as well but it's yeah. been benef benefiting about 80 families i think it's less now i think a lot of them have been pruned out of it <laughs> it's something like 26 families now so hmm. it's um you know, it, it's continually, you know, the system is, is not doing well. Mm. Um, and it is, it is falling apart. And so these monopolies of violence, they, they go everywhere. Now, now part of that, part of that wrong system, it didn't start very long ago. It started um, as a way of, um, of, of regaining lands from indigenous people in the Southern hemisphere um, that people from the Northern hemisphere had treaties with. Mm. And then they decided, well, they want that land as well. Mm -hmm. And so they came up with a trick uh, to get that land off those people legally. Uh, so they, they invented this idea that land was capital. Mm -hmm. La land could, could be capital that could be, and you could foreclose on that land as security in a debt. So they mm -hmm. financialized land. And mm -hmm. once that happened, it was pretty much the beginning of the end. It was the mm. most profound act of violence. So once land became something, not something that people were part of, but just leverage for debt, then it killed it. It completely killed it, and it and it and it uh, facilitated our complete separation from the landscape. So it's almost like once that decision was made, found yeah. act of violence. Yeah, and once look, it's the, self organizing the, from that point onwards, almost. Like... Yeah, and so so the the violence done to the landscape. You know, which is the mother, um, it became exponential at that stage, it became exponential. And once you have um, a, a sick system, um, that system throws up pathologies. You know, you'll have pangolins that will be desperately trying to mutate in real time and will be using its, its, its tiny, almost invisible entities, its, its friends that help it mutate to try and respond to a changing environment. Um, those things are viruses. They help us to mutate in real time within a generation rather than across multiple generations. You know, it, it helps us change our form, you know, uh, to come into a place, a different place or a changing place, you know. Um, so you get pangolins that will, they'll throw out pathologies that will then cross species <laughs> and that will then, you know, um, so, so, Pathogens are always a response. They're a comorbidity with a sick mm. landscape. So if mm. we're not um, doing our right job, if we're not in our right story as custodians mm. of, of land, you know, uh, if we're not being in our right role as a custodial species and keeping the balances mm. going and keeping the energies moving throughout the system and keeping those energies distributed you know, through the ceremony and through the practice that you've described. If we're not doing that, the system does become sick. Hmm. You know, we're in wrong relation, extractive relation. So, so some, some of this yeah. kind of like guilty explanation of things when people try and point to specific things, like they'll be like, oh, yeah. forest has happened because there's a wet market in China or like these things yeah. happen because this blah, blah, blah. To, to you, they're, they're all downstream effects of that original violence that was done. Yeah. Right? It's kind of yeah. inevitable from that point. There's no point pointing the finger yeah. after that kind of it. It's yeah. Kind of and we try and we try and blame ourselves and each other. You know, we look at all the plastics in the ocean and we go, oh, there's just some of us who are still not recycling. But, you know, 90% of the plastics in the ocean, you know, actually come from, um, you know, the textiles industry. Most of that comes from textiles mm. and, and the mm. shift to different materials because we needed to use this oil for something more, you know, yeah. to create these polymers, you know, mm. because we, we want to sell more of it or whatever. Mm. And when I say we, well, that's not us. We don't care how much oil they sell. <laughs> right. Anyway, so, you know, most of the plastics in the ocean come from, textile manufacture mm. it's not us with our littering right. you know mm. and litter itself is a mythology that was invented you know and we've responded to that with recycling thinking we're going to save the planet it's like no nah. see you know when um you know uh howard when you were a kid when i was a kid remember milk bottles mm -hmm. it, everything was like that there wasn't litter when I, when we were kids 
the it, packaging was we had to be trained into accepting the idea of ex, uh, disposable packaging you had your bags you had your containers and you kept using them and and you know if you didn't use them then you collected them in a box and sent them back to be refilled that was just normal that's what we used to do and that's what we've always done <laughs> we had to be trained and you know how we were trained we were trained through these pretend environmental um, movements these organizations uh, so they had uh, in the states they had keep america beautiful do you remember that keep america beautiful all those ads we because we had the same ones here keep australia beautiful um, that was a foundation doing that but that was a foundation that was sponsored by um, uh, disposable packaging um, uh, companies uh, so this is like the anheuser Busch too- saying drink responsibly yeah, it, no, it was a, it was about training us to throw out our rubbish rather than reusing it. Uh-huh. So this, Ra- this, rather than this, saying I don't want rubbish in the first place, make, yeah, make me make false, me things. Uh-huh. This false environmental thing that was allegedly about stopping us from littering and continuing to ruin our environment like irresponsibly. It was actually to train us uh, to use to, to throw our packaging away rather than reuse it. You know. So be responsible with your litter. What's litter? Oh, it's 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 all this stuff. Oh, that's that's that stuff I reuse. Well, also- no, 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 that's litter <laughs> that you're ruining the environment with. You have to throw it in the bin. Lots and lots of it, and we'll take care mm-hmm. of it from there. You know, it, everything's a lie. Mm-hmm. All this right. stuff is a but, lie. But what, what I'm hearing what I'm hearing from you about this um, the story about litter is it's not only training us to not to throw it out, it's training us to blame ourselves. Yeah, for, and for to the think problem. of ourselves as selfish, irresponsible creatures who need to comply and submit um, to these, you know, institutions, um, you know, a, 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 in order to curb our, our excesses, because we're, I mean, we're all just chimps in clothes, aren't we? We, we, we can't help it, um, you know. We're, we're ridiculous mm-hmm. things. And if left to our own devices, it's just going to be endless rape and murder. And oh, because 30% of humans before agriculture died from homicide, you know, all this, all this well, rubbish. I, yeah. And I've heard people talking about, you know, beautiful self organizing fractal systems in nature to justify Google having a monopoly or Facebook having a monopoly because of an 80 20 power law. That yeah. that assumes that that you know that human that the commonwealth has to eventually be a winner take all yeah. uh, endeavor. Yeah, it's that uh, multipolar trap thing I mentioned earlier. Yeah, so, but I so think I, th- um, oh, I think yeah. No, I just think I think your discipline has, has a lot of answers. Um, you know, in, in how you do it, but then also how you describe it. That message that you gave before that needs to get out there. Mm. That, that one about that distributing. Yeah, distributing. You know, your energy and your mind out around you. And, yeah. And that becoming, yeah. Because um, when people realize that they're not going to lose themselves mm. um, in, in doing that, that actually you become more individually, yeah. paradoxically, you know, uh, when you become part of a collective being, um, I, I think that will help. Awesome. Well, you've inspired me to double down on my practice and, and get better at explaining it to people as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the same yeah. Time. Now, that was a revelation to me because I couldn't express what I was seeing in those videos. And that was it. And that was it. Yeah. It's, it's a revelation to me that somebody can see it from the outside. Do you know what I mean? Without being trained to see it in a way, without, without physically going through, you know, through the same things and still being able to see it even through a video screen, you know, removed mm. of concept. That, that's amazing to me. That's a, it, it just speaks to... You know the connectedness. That there's something that we've all forgotten. You know, there's something yeah. that we've or we've been we've been told a different story that's masked it. That's put all these things away. And this, you know, I mean, I guess it seems like a cliche. This whole idea that if you take everything away, you understand that it's all a big oneness and there's interconnection yeah. and all the boundaries put, we put there are artificial. But, but it, like I said, you don't take make everything away. True. Sure. You, mm. you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Like I, yeah. I had that metaphor with the bucket. You just tip it sure. upside down and shake it, mm. and, and the the wrong story falls out. When you when and like I said, when I look back in that bucket, science is still there. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, science is good, but yeah. but these uh, pseudo sciences um, that are kind of sneaky been put in there uh, mm-hmm. alongside the other science, mm-hmm. they they don't last. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. part of that is the um, 
is that caveman mythology. Mm. You know, that, that has um, very much infected the sciences and the scientific story. No, yes. There's almost like a, it's, it's been described to me in, um, so I, I was trained as a biologist and it, there's almost this, have you ever heard of the concept of physics envy? And people talk about that. So people, when they do a biology degree, they're like, well, biologists are more woolly than chemists. Chemists are more precise than biologists, but the chemists have physics envy because they can't make it all into just pure math and that kind of stuff. So <laughs> physicists look down and mathematicians look down on everybody, right? You know what I mean? So it's like yeah. physics, physicists think they're the real scientists and that chemists just play around with physics, which has got a little bit bigger. And, um, and then they look at biologists and say, oh, you guys are barely doing science you're just kind of putting pattern on the things but the biologist will tell you no these things are almost irreducibly complex and you be, yeah. and you have to they get so big that it's almost like an entire intelligent system and the, the more we've learned about it and the more we've tried to understand how an ecosystem works the mm. more we've uh, or a brain works or like a you know a, a social system works um the more we realize that you can't every time you reduce it every time you try and look at it and you allude to this in the book actually when you uh, compare it to heisenberg's uncertainty principle you know every yeah. time you study a system something stops moving and then you're actually the thing you're looking at is not actually the system anymore you know it's like you you break something every time you look at it um and yeah. this happens in biology too and i think the, the more that i've learned the more i've had to throw out assumptions about things i've learned in biology and just accept that it's part of a bigger whole that i'll never fully mm understand through that little reducing mm. pattern spotting let's make it as small yeah. as possible thing and it can only be understood by kind of accepting and looking at the wider system you know feeling yeah. and that takes a different that, type of knowledge different type of teaching i think like, yeah that's why i always talk to people at the margins because mm. it, it is very interesting so i mean my my favorite people and i seek them out now my favorite people to talk to are, are disgruntled mathematicians <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> And some of them, and, and they say the most insane things. And, um, but there's like, uh, they're, they're, they're in that sort of madness that they find, um, you know, because they've been alienated from their institution or whatever, or someone's stolen their work or, and they're, they're disgruntled or they've been canceled, you know, because they said the wrong thing. And, and, um, and the conclusions they arrive at, then when, when they turn that mathematical lens back on all the disciplines, uh, they're just very interesting. Mm. And they're not necessarily true or right, but they're, um, they are interesting and they do lead you in other directions. So mm. you know, I, I listen to everybody, but I particularly listen to um, people at the margins. And at the moment, for the last month, my favorite marginal group has been disgruntled mathematicians. Um, have, you, have you ever come across Stephen Wolfram? Sorry, I just I had to get this one in because Brian Marco asked me to talk about him. Stephen Wolfram, the mathematician, or do it. so he has this whole idea about how any system that's um, irreducibly complex it get, um, moves towards intelligence. And so he's, he's saying if you have like a natural system, which is it's insanely difficult to model with mathematics, yeah. like fluid dynamics moving over rocks and things like that, that you could argue that that system is now intelligent. And 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 Brian's my friend is a you know a physicist and a mathematician he's reading your stuff and he's going oh he's what he's saying about rocks is like stephen wolfram says this as well you know this mathematician mm. has said about it's so complex it can't not be intelligent in a way right well, have you ever come across this stuff or? no i haven't but maybe that's the definition of intelligence and consciousness is quite simply that which can't be modeled <laughs> wow that's yeah <laughs> yeah Inter yeah Woo. See, so I'm blown out. Yeah, yeah, that's got yeah, me now. Yeah. Like it's amazing the things that fall out, you know, yeah. when you start getting crazy. Yeah. Is this yeah. a proper yarn? I'm interested to know. Is like this is this is this is how it works, right? These things just come out of the that you didn't intend to come yeah, out of the, I, uh, of the of the interaction. This is, this is certainly yarn adjacent. Yarn adjacent. Some, okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's um, yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of our, I don't know, a lot of the the patterns of it. Yeah. That are quite fractal, but but yeah. somehow manage to return back to these themes. Yeah, and, and 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 they build on like. Have you noticed that there's this kind of foundational kind of truth mm. that we keep revisiting in this spiraling sort of way, and and it and yeah. uh, building on it, and yeah. everything that we say together seems to build on that foundation. Yeah, it's and like it's making it clearer what, and clearer. It's like yeah, we build on what the last person has said. And, yeah, you know, it doesn't matter if we agree with it or not. It's like mm. the aggregate of all those stories. Yeah. And now you, you're bringing in other stories from other people, uh -huh. you know, and we've been doing that. <laughs> yeah. And there, it's not just three people meeting here. It's about, you know, 30,000 yeah. um, different people and stories that we're, we're aggregating here. And, 
Yeah, so it has that same sort of fractal pattern of a yarn. Nice. Um, right. and yeah, one, and one of the one of the things that personally has moved me the most about the way you present it is I don't I don't even know if humility is the right word from my perspective. It's it's a, de a desire to not marginalize anybody or dismiss them. Like you you talk about with what you get from the flat earthers. So you yeah, know, I, I go running in the mornings and I see Trump signs on my neighbor's lawns, and I've started trying not to be narcissistic about it, I'm trying to to come up with other ways of thinking that I'm better than. Yeah. And so when we're you know it's like you talk about haptic cognition, I feel like like since I can't do this by myself, that other people are going to be like the, the other nodes in my haptic cognition. And in order for that to work, I can't constantly be evaluating them and putting them into these buckets of good or bad. And, mm. I, and I really appreciate the spirit that, that you bring to, to that like, profound respect. Like I think mm. to me, that's the, the, what I'm getting from this conversation. The basis of your work is that humans are not broken. We're not mm. evil. We have been domesticated in systems that we haven't seen, and you were fortunate enough to be raised and adopted into systems that showed you a different view, and you are sort of a bridge between them, and therefore you can help others to sort of, you know, to flip up yeah. into multiple dimensions as well. It's strangely like my alienation and marginality in both systems is... Um is is what you know and the profound violence of, of existing in that space um you know upon my person which i you know i've spent a good deal of my life resenting unproductively that's the thing that allows me to to be able to act in some kind of translation role and to be able to see um to be able to see all of these things um you know more holistically so it, it, it's a gift um you know, and I keep telling people trauma is not what happens at the point of impact. You know, trauma happens later when you fail to make meaning of that impact. Mm. Yeah. And um, it took me about 30 years to learn that. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm still learning it. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, thank you so much. This has been like, such an honor, such a treat. Oh, and for me, I was so looking forward to it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm so, sorry, Howie, if we uh, um, bogarted the conversation there and steered it heavily towards the martial arts and a little bit less less yeah. towards ecosystems and ways of thinking. <laughs> well, look, more, more than anything, um, the three of us have brought together our elders here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, so this is, mm. I, I see this as old man Juma in, um, in, in dialogue uh, with your, with your <laughs> with team. Mikhail Rabko. Who I encountered. <laughs> electronically a, a decade ago and um yeah probably around the same time as i was encountering all man juma so this is something that's been uh you know happening uh f for a longer time frame than this interview wow. which um i think is lovely yeah this has been yeah. is it, i i don't think i could have had higher expectations of this conversation coming in i'm like this is going to be different mm. it's going to be weird it was more different and weirder than i ever could have expected and it was wonderful so thank, yeah. thank you very very much uh, i really hope we can sure. stay in touch and we can uh, we can talk more yeah definitely um yeah i hope uh yeah there's there's borders open enough at some stage where um yeah i'd like to do some of that practice and uh i would actually like to go through the slappy thing yeah uh, at some stage before i die that, uh, All right. <laughs> that slappy ritual because um that sounds that sounds like just what i need <laughs> well, anytime you're in our hemisphere let me know and i'll see if i can let's see if i can arrange for it sure. <laughs> for sure so we'll have a night knife fight and slap each other for a while and we'll see what falls out all right, Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> all right brothers all right thank you so much thank you so all much right. appreciate see you later thank thank you. You. bye bye